the course. And today is the last course. It says a lecture 11, but it's actually going to be 14. Before we start, a few seconds of respect for the Ukrainians fighting for their freedom and for ours. Today's course is about transactions. It's also shared state concurrency. And I'm not a big fan of shared state concurrency. You have probably noticed that, except for transactions. Transactions is actually a very good and powerful idea. So this is actually a very good, a good way of managing state that has to survive crashes. And it was all invented for large databases. In the older days, I'm talking about like 1960s, people started doing business with computers. Uh, IBM was very big in those days. And they had databases. And the databases crash sometimes. And the data has to survive. And you have to update the databases and manage banks. Transactions were invented for that. Large databases are actually the core of many, many companies, even internet companies as well, but Amazon, for example. And they have to be resilient. That means if they crash, the data has to stay good when it's rebooted, because it's critical information. Also, they have to have high performance. If you have a bank, you can have millions of customers. So they have to be scalable. If the bank is growing, you have to increase the size and it has to keep working. So these are like the three critical properties. And transactions are made for that. They're made for performance, they're made for resilience and scalability. So let me show you. Let me go back to this motivating example, really to show you why you need transactions. So here's a database. It's a large array of cells, so you can update each of these things. They could be bank accounts or something. Here there's 1,000, but there usually are millions, or, or hundreds of millions even in big databases. And I want to update this. I want to keep the data consistent. So I use a lock, right? So here's the lock. So if I want to transfer money from one account to another, I get the lock, I do the transfer, and then I release the lock. That works, but it's very slow because the lock is a bottleneck. Okay, everybody has to go through the lock. So that's not good enough. So what do they? What do people do? Well, you actually put in one lock for each cell because it's the cells that are updated. And so if I want to update C zero, I have to get the lock for C zero. So you don't have two concurrent updates there. But in fact, it's not quite good enough. So here's an example. So let's say they're all bank accounts. Okay, and have money in each one of them. Now let's say I have a transaction T1, which is a money transfer from C1 to C2. And there's another transaction, a money transfer from C3 to C2. So money is going in to C2. But these transactions, you have to be very careful because of the, their concurrent and the scheduler, and they might overlap. Uh, T1 will read C1, for example. T2 will read C3. And maybe T2 immediately writes C2 with a lock. And then T1 gets the lock and writes C2. That means this value is overwritten. The money that transfers from C2 disappears. Poof. Okay, so that doesn't work. So somehow, individual locks is too fine-grained. You have to have a way of combining them if you, you do things on multiple cells. And that's the whole trick of transactions. Okay? So, okay, some um, motivation. If you do a bank transfer, you do multiple operations. Maybe you read, you write, uh -huh. you, you, you remove the amount in one and you add the amount in another. That's already two writes. But maybe there's a third write. There's an audit. Maybe there's a tax. There's a fourth write. Maybe you have to make a report. Fifth write. So there's many, many things going on. 
So you combine all that to make big atomic actions. That's the usual way we do it, okay? Now, the new thing here is that the thing can crash anytime. Actions, that means these atomic actions, either they work, we say they commit, or there's a problem and then we, they have to be removed and we say they abort. How can we make this work? So here's the basic idea of how it works. So the database is stored on disk, uh, but the disk might be corrupted. Let's say I'm writing on the disk and it crashes in the middle. Well, the disk is still, is still uh, uh, usable. Huh? If you reboot the system, you can read the disk. But maybe you only did a few of the writes and the other ones you didn't do, so the data is corrupted. So how can we ensure it doesn't, work, doesn't happen? Okay, the, uh, the technique is that when you update the data on the disk, you start by making all the updates in a special temporary place on the disk. Okay? And when everything is on the disk, then you make a switch. You say, this is now the best, the, 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 modern, the, the, the current data. Uh, you write one word to the disk at the end to do the switch. That means the hardware has to satisfy this property. A one word write to the disk must be atomic. Okay? That means it either happens or it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in halfway. That is the condition on the hardware for the disk. And if you have a crash anytime then, when you reboot, if it crashes before this write, then you restore the old value. If it crashes after, you have the new. So with this, you can guarantee that the database is not corrupt. Okay? Okay, so how do you do, uh, and there's another technique to make things go very fast. You make multiple updates, can execute in parallel, and as much as possible, you keep temporary copies, copies in the RAM memory. And only when everything is done, you make like a block transfer to the disk. Okay? So you minimize the number of transfers to disk and you make them all like blocks because a disk write can be very efficient if it's done as a block write. Okay? So that's the basic technique for doing things. But still, you have to arrange that the transactions, when they overlap, even if there's no crash, huh, you have to manage the logs. So we're not done, huh? By far not done here. So, the transactions have to have certain properties. There's a famous acronym called ACID, which is four properties. There are four letters. And this is the four properties the transactions have to have. It's kind of uh, tweaked so that it becomes a word, okay? We will see. So the A means atomic, either commit or abort, okay? It has to be atomic. C means consistency. That means the invariance of the database have to be respected. So this is actually, A is the responsibility of the system. C is actually the programmer's responsibility. Uh, if you do money transfers, the total money in the bank should not change, of course. That's an invariant, huh? So the transactions have to be designed for that. And the I means isolation. That means transactions don't interfere with each other. This is not the same as atomicity, huh? It means the two transactions, it's as if they're done in sequential order. So they might be parallel for speed, but the semantics is exactly as if one of them was done before the other. And this, it's also called serializability, but the acronym is not so nice with serializability, so that's why people talk about isolation. But isolation and serializability are basically the same thing. And the final one is durability. This is the fact that it survives crashes. It's permanent storage. This also, the other word for this is persistence, but P is also not so nice for the acronyms when people talk about durability. Okay? So those are the four properties. And the, I told you how atomicity is achieved. Consistency is the program responsibility when you write the transaction. But uh, isolation is not so easy. Serializability. This one is kind of tricky. Okay? And so we will uh, 
spend a bit of time seeing how you can do that. Okay. Uh, there's a variation called lightweight or ACI, where you don't have durability, where it's just in memory. It's an abortable atomic action. So it's like a lock, but you can abort it. Okay? But it could be abort for many reasons. Uh, uh, some invariant not satisfied, something uh, you do, some computation is not good. So this is like a program abstraction. Okay? And when it aborts, all the variables are restored. So it's actually much better than exceptions, okay? You know that when you have an error, you can raise an exception, and then the exception handler fixes things. That's actually pretty nasty, and like we saw for Erlang, huh? In Erlang, this kind of defensive programming, it's not nice. But transactions is also a good fix to this, because the transaction does all the work of restoring the variables. So you don't have to worry about restoring the variables. The transaction implementation will do it. So a transaction is actually much better than exceptions, if you have it, okay? This thing is sometimes called STM. Uh, for example, people using Haskell have very often used STM, Software Transactional Memory. So there's this STM acronym that's often used for this. Okay, so that's just a comment. Now I want to talk about how do you manage this isolation? How do you manage that when the transactions overlap, they don't mess each other up. And that is a big field, huge amount of research in there. That's called concurrency control. So that's kind of a weird name, but it's for historical reasons. Concurrency control is all the techniques that you use to build systems with transactional properties. That is called Concurrency control, okay? It's not transaction implementation or techniques for transaction, no, it's called concurrency control. And so there's a lot of stuff going on here. So let me give you introduction to this. So in today's course, I'm going to give you a full algorithm for implementing ACI transactions. So I won't do the durability bit, but you, you can see you could add that. So I'm going to show you a full algorithm so you'll understand everything. And the algorithm does this. It will do optimistic concurrency control with strict two-phase locking and deadlock avoidance. So these three highlighted things are important. And many transaction systems have variations of them. Huh? So this is just one of many possible transaction systems. Okay, so these highlighted bits, we're going to explain them. And if you want to see the full code of this transaction manager, it's in the textbook. It's two quite dense pages of OS code, most complicated algorithm book, but it's completely there. So I will give you all the ideas of this. I won't show you the actual code of the implementation because we won't have time. But I, I will give you all the ideas of the implementation of this. And uh, if you're really curious, you can see the code in the textbook. Okay. It was not easy writing that code, by the way. Okay, it took a long time, a lot of thinking. Okay. So concurrency control. There's many different ways of doing transactions. And there's many axes. There's many variable things that you can choose when you make a transaction manager. And there's three main axes I'm going to talk about today. One is a transaction manager can be optimistic or pessimistic. That's kind of a strange thing, but I'll show you what that means. So optimistic means you just give the locks and you don't worry. Because if there's a, if there's a conflict, the transaction will abort. And that's okay. But pessimistic means you are very careful about giving locks because it's very expensive when there's a conflict. So, for example, uh, allocating... This, this can be done in many systems. Huh? Trains running on train tracks. So, the train can be considered a kind of a transaction and the track is like a cell, is a resource. So, if you allocate the track to this train, 
You don't want to allocate it to another train because maybe if both trains go on the track, if there's a conflict, then people will die. Okay, so there you will need pessimistic, but optimistic it's when the failures are not so so costly, like allocating too many seats on an airplane. If someone has to give up a seat, yeah, who cares? Okay, the second access is lock management. This is for serializability. So this is pretty tricky, and there's many techniques for this. And the final one is also a tricky one, deadlocks. So this whole thing has some epiphenomenon. Something happens in this kind of system, which is called deadlock. So any system where you have activities that need resources, that have to allocate, you can have this, this, this uh, thing that happens called deadlock, where the system just locks up and doesn't do anything. So this has to be handled because it just happens. It's a natural property of such systems. So we'll talk about that too. So those are the three prop things. Now, before we go into that, I want to talk to you about the properties, two kinds of, the properties of this system, uh, where the system, there's system invariance, and then the system makes progress, like no starvation. So safety and liveness properties are important because you can you have to, when you define these, it tells you how to build the system, okay? So when we start implementing these to satisfy these properties, we will need some primitive building blocks. So locks you already know, locks control access, and it's important for safety, huh? managing invariant. If you lock the system, you can't mess up the data. So the fact that the data is correctly representing something is uh, an invariant, is a safety property, and that's managed by locks. But the other kind of property is the system has to advance, has to make progress, and never stop. And that is called the liveness property. And in order to manage that, we have another concept called timestamps. And so we will give priorities to operations to make sure there's no starvation, that all transactions advance. Okay. So this one will be very important for deadlock, because deadlock will kill the liveness. Okay. So, they, so we have two kinds of properties and two kinds of building blocks that we use to build transactions. Okay. So you see it's a really big area. Okay. I'm just scratching the surface. And we will make one kind of, we will show one actually quite nice transaction manager, but there's many others, okay? Okay, before that, I would like to make a small detour and talk about safety and liveness, because safety and liveness are really important ideas, and they appear in many, many areas, so they appear here in transactions, but anytime you build a large system, you have safety and liveness. So maybe you've seen already, have you seen safety and liveness in another course? Have you seen formal definition of it? Which course did you see it? Uh, L'info 1252, System Informatic. Okay, you saw safety, what safety? Did you see the formal definition of it? No, okay, so good. So you have already some idea of what it is. I want to give you a formal definition of them, okay? Uh, so we want to build a system that's correct, that's reasonable. So there's some properties it has to satisfy. And if it satisfies those properties, it's correct. But in fact, there's two kinds of properties. And safety and liveness are two fundamentally different kinds of properties. And uh, the safety properties basically mean that bad things don't happen. So that's the intuition. Huh? And the liveness says that good things will eventually happen. So if you're traveling on the road, the safety property is that you respect the, the law, the traffic uh, laws. But the liveness property means that you actually arrive at your destination. Okay, you can, you can satisfy one of these two very easily. It's very easy by, to satisfy safety by doing nothing. Okay? It's very easy to satisfy liveness if you don't care about safety. Uh, you just go ahead and you don't care about the laws. The problem is when you have to do both. Okay, so that's the intuition. 
But I want to make a formal definition now. And so these are properties. So a property, P, is a function of an execution that is true or false. So it's a predicate. An execution, so this goes back to the semantics. So I go back a little bit to the semantics of us that was seen in the previous course. So an execution consists of a sequence of execution states. Each state has threads and memory, okay, and it makes transitions whenever there's an instruction executed. So it's this potentially infinite sequence of execution states, okay, starting with some initial state and going on. Of course, the scheduler makes choices. So even the same program, if you run it more than once, you can have different executions. Okay, so this is the the formal way of presenting an of a, how a system runs. Okay, and we will define safety in terms and liveness in terms of executions. And in fact, there is a very important property of safety and liveness, which I will not prove. But if you are mathematically inclined, you can find this pretty easily. But the proof is not so simple. It's using properties of topology. Any property of a system can be expressed as the conjunction of a safety and a liveness property. So this is a mathematical uh, uh, result that holds for any property at all. So if you build a system and you had it satisfy some property, you can always separate that property into a pure safety and a pure liveness. So this was proved by Alpern and Schneider in 1985. So this is a famous result. Which that means is that safety and liveness are really the only two things that are important. Okay. So, but I will not give the proof, but, it, but actually it's kind of neat. You can look at it there. You can look it up if you're interested. I will just define safety and liveness. To prove them, I will introduce the concept, two concepts, prefix and extension. So here is an execution, okay, which goes on, can go on for a long time. A prefix is basically the first k execution states for some k, okay. So you basically cut off the tail. So it's a finite size uh, sequence of execution states, okay. And an extension of a prefix is an execution that starts with the prefix, but then it just goes on in and, and any other way, any way. So you have your system that starts running like this, and at this point, you, it can keep running, and because of the scheduler and so on, there can be many possible extensions. Huh? So it's any execution that starts with the prefix, uh, a particular prefix. So you have prefix and extension. With these two concepts, we can define safety and liveness formally. Okay, first I define safety. I first give an informal version of the formal definition, and then I give the formal definition. So I'm not really a, a, a Dijkstra a adept, or a, in France, a Bourbaki adept. For me, intuition is very important in mathematics. It's not just formal results. So when I give you a formal definition, I always will give intuition, okay? So I'm very much an engineer. I like mathematics, but I'm not really a mathematician. So the intuition is very important. So a property P is a property of an execution, a full execution. It's a safety property that every execution which does not satisfy it has somewhere a bad event. It means at some point the execution state is bad and once it becomes bad, it stays bad. Uh, so the intuition is I hold an egg, okay, I'm walking with this egg, I throw the egg on the ground, splat, okay, so the egg is broken and I cannot fix it, okay, Humpty Dumpty, when he falls off the wall, all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put him together again. So that, the fact that he is alive is a safety property. And when he falls off, he's violating his property. Okay. So the formal definition 
follows that. Once the system goes bad, it stays bad. So here's the formal definition. A property P is a safety property if the following holds. So given any execution such that the property is false, okay, so we have an execution where safety is false, then there exists a prefix such that every extension of that prefix gives an execution also false. That means at some point you can say the system breaks and no matter what you do after that, it stays broken. Okay? So a safety property is a property where in a finite prefix you can already see the system break and any extension of that will stay broken. And you cannot fix it. Okay, so that's a safety property. If you can fix it, it's not a safety property. Yeah? Okay, so that's safety. So here's an example of a safety property. Simple example. I send messages between two agents on an unreliable network. So a message from agent one to agent two. Every message sent is delivered at most once. That is a safety property, okay? So how can you break that? Well, it's very easy. You deliver the message more than once. So it's delivered once, and then somehow, for some weird reason, it gets delivered a second time. The property is broken, okay? But you cannot fix that. You cannot undeliver a message. You have delivered it twice. Whatever you do after that, the system is broken because you have broken the system by delivering the message more than once, okay? So that's an example of a safety property. Once you break an invariant, it's all over, okay? Okay, now I go to liveness, which is the other side of the coin. So here is the definition. So given an execution, so this is the formal definition, any execution where liveness is true, Okay, so the whole, we're looking at the whole execution. Now, liveness is true. That means that if that is the case, then for every prefix, there exists an extension such that it's true. That means you could always make it true. If you have, an ex you have a prefix and it's not true yet, you can always find a way to make it true. Okay? So you could... You could uh, say this something like, as long as there is life, there is hope. As long as the system is running, it has the ability to make the thing true. No matter what happens in the prefix. Okay? So here's an example. It's very similar to the previous one. Messages again on a network. So the liveness property says the message is delivered at least not at most, but at least once, okay? So this, we can see that liveness holds, that this is a liveness property. So given a prefix, if the delivery is there, we're fine. Every extension satisfies P, so there's at least one. But if the prefix does not contain the delivery, we can extend it so that it contains a delivery. That means the system, there is an execution, there is an extension, where it does contain a delivery. Okay, so at least one. That means even if the prefix does not contain a delivery, you can extend it so it does contain the delivery. Okay, so as long as there's life, there's hope. This is my way of visualizing this. Your mileage may vary, so I'm a very visual person. I like uh, visual. Uh, uh, representations of things. So here the top is safety. So here I have an execution. Okay. Safety is false for this execution. If there exists a prefix, so here's the prefix, such that all extensions are false. So in this prefix, basically the system is broken. Okay. And if it's false, you can always show it in finite time, somewhere in here. Okay. So that's safety. Liveness is here. Here I have an execution. For all prefixes, not just to exist, for all prefixes, I can find at least one way to make it true, to go forward. Okay? 
That means there's always a way to advance. The system will not block my advance. Okay? If liveness is false, you can only show that in infinite time, because in any finite time, if it doesn't happen, it might happen later. Okay? We don't know. The only way to show liveness is false is to look at the whole execution. Okay? Notice, if you compare these two, there's a very interesting duality. Yeah? Exist a prefix for all prefix, for all extension, exist extension. So, for me, this is a good way of distinguishing them. Your mileage may vary, but I add that in case it helps you. Okay. So, some more conclusion on safety. Safety can only be satisfied in infinite time. You're never actually safe, huh? I walk around with an egg, I could always drop it down. And the only way to know that I have not dropped the egg is to look at the whole execution, which is basically infinite time, huh? So you're never, you can never be really sure that you're safe in a finite time, huh? You have, the only way that you can guarantee that you're safe is to look at the whole execution. Of course, it's, when it's violated, it's finite. In the finite time, when you drop the egg, it's broken. Okay? If I have a property with the words never, at most, cannot, blah, 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 this, this typically will be a safety property. Uh, sometimes it's called partial correctness also. Okay, so that's safety. Liveness is the other side of the coin. Okay? So liveness can be satisfied in finite time. So we're waiting for something good to happen, and it happens. But it happens at some finite time. But the only way that it can be violated is to look at all execution. Huh? So I'm, I'm driving around, I want to go to the beach. Uh, do I ever reach the beach? Well, the only way to see that I don't reach the beach is to look at all execution, because maybe after 500 years, I eventually will reach the beach, okay? So, you can only violate that in infinite time. But it's satisfied in finite time. So you see, it's kind of a dual to uh, safety. And when you have properties that talk about eventually, it must do this, at least, okay? So eventually, what that means, technically, that it, the, the thing will happen at some unknown point in the future. So some finite time in the future, okay? So termination of an algorithm is liveness, okay? That's a typical liveness property. Okay, now, to get your brains working a little bit, let me ask you a couple of questions. Okay? So, there's a different way of defining safety. So, we define safety as a property of the whole execution. But actually, that's not the only way you can define safety. You could define it like this. That every execution state is safe. So for all execution states, they're safe. So for example, I'm holding an egg. So I could say, in each state, the egg is not broken. Right? In each state, the egg is not broken. That would be another way of defining that particular safety property, instead of saying that the, the egg is never broken in the execution, okay? But in fact, it's, there's good reason why it's not defined like this. So now I'm, I'm doing a little bit uh, specification engineering, huh? We have two ways of defining safety, a property of a whole execution, and here would be another way. For all execution states, so this EI, uh, so it's basically the thread state plus the memory at a particular instant. So every state satisfies P. So this is a different P. Uh, this is a P that works on execution states. So this would be another way. It seems simpler, huh? Because execution states are these fairly simple things, whereas an execution is this big infinite thing, okay? But in fact, this way is not so good. This way has some problems. What do you think? Can you imagine a safety property that is nice and interesting, but that you cannot write this way, 
but you can write it that way. Yeah? Um, I lost the word. Could you say in French? I will translate. Uh, or whatever. Interaction, you don't know the execution of the server, but you're getting what well, when like when you send a request for a web page, you your execution is the request, and you, the next state is the answer. But you right. don't know what the server does. Ah, okay. So you're saying the request is done in one execution state, and the reply comes in a later execution state. Yeah. No. So, um, so the, the thing is that the, the property would be for every request there is exactly one reply. Is that, that would be a safety property, right? Something like that? Yeah. But that's actually an example. You cannot represent it like this because you're actually comparing two different execution states. So when I make the request in one execution state, then there has to be one reply in a later execution state. So the property is a property of those two execution states. If I look at each one of them individually, I cannot determine it. So the, the thing is, sometimes you need to look at more than one execution state for the safety in, which you don't do in the second definition, okay? Yeah, so that's right, so that's kind of the reason but it took a long time for people to understand that. In the 1990s, people were still sometimes defining safety like that, in books and stuff. Okay? There's a book by Eric Tell on distributed algorithms, and he defines it from the 1990s, he defines it like this. Yeah, it takes a while for people to figure out how things are supposed to be the right way. So you see the difference, huh? So this is important. So this kind of question is important. When I give you a definition, it's not arbitrary, yeah? There's good reason why it's this definition and not something else. So you have to always in your mind ask your question, why is it like defined like this and not some other way? Okay? So, so, uh, so that's the question. So here's another question for you. So I like bugging you, huh? So I told you that safety and liveness were enough. So is every property really safety or liveness? So for example, what about this property? Every message should be delivered exactly once. Is that safety or liveness? You tell me. I'm, I'm uh, playing with your mind here. Huh? You have to be you have to answer this. It's enough to have clear thinking, yeah? Uh, both, I would say. What do you mean both? It's both safety and loveness because before we saw that delivering at most once is safety, at least one is liveness, so if we combine the two we get safety and liveness. Yeah, but this particular property is not both, huh? It's actually a conjunction of a safety and a liveness property, okay? Because the property uh, at most once is not a liveness property, at least once is not a safety property, okay? So you can, the same way you can say this is neither, okay? With the same argument you gave, you can say this one is neither. It is neither, but it actually is actually the conjunction. So here I'm, I'm making with your mind, Every property is not liveness or safety, but it can be written as a conjunction of a little safety and a liveness. But when you write it down, when people write down properties, they don't always think about that, okay? They sometimes just write it down, and, that, and the property is like this one. It's neither safety or liveness. So it's actually important that you split it into a safety and a liveness, that you separate them. That's actually very important to get things clear. Because the implementation has to do very different things to satisfy safety or liveness, huh? So a safety property, huh? 
so for example, safety property for a, a Tesla self-driving car is actually very hard. Safety would, for example, be that you never run into a human being, okay? That's a safety property. That seems to be quite hard. But liveness, just driving on and, and, re and reaching the destination, that's actually easier, okay? The problem, the real trick is the safety. So it's important to s separate them, okay? So that's an important thing. Okay, so that's all about safety and liveness. When we build transaction systems, we will be clear to separate them. And if you follow other courses, so there's another course that I give on distributed algorithms, uh, Info 2345. There also, we're very clear to separate safety and liveness. Because otherwise, you get messy and, you, and the, you're not thinking clearly, okay? If you want to really find a complicated algorithm, you have to clearly separate safety and life. So when you define a system, don't mix them up because the techniques for satisfying them are very different and you don't want to mix it, okay? So separating into safety and lightness is important. Okay, so what we're going to do that here, so you see the locking is a lightness property, it's a safety property, sorry, and the deadlock avoidance is a liveness property, okay? So they're very separate things, and the mechanisms are very different, okay? So let me go back now to concurrency control. We're going to build a transaction manager now, okay? So we're going to build a transaction system that does everything. It's a bit harder than the, the locks we did. It's a bit harder than the locks. So it's like this, a transaction system. We, so the system has this structure. We, each of these boxes is a thread with some kind of an agent. Uh, here inside each of these T boxes we have a transaction. The transaction is actually managed inside this box by a thread. There's actually, it's an execution of a piece of code and it's single threaded, okay? So the transactions will be single threaded and they can send messages to this other agent called the transaction manager. So you see it's very interesting, yeah? Because transaction, which is a shared state concept, I'm implementing it using message passing multi-agent ideas, yeah? Because this is by far the easiest way to implement transaction managers, okay? So each transaction runs in one thread and communicates, so it sends messages to the transaction manager. And the transaction manager will then accept messages from all these guys, and all the concurrency control is done inside the transaction manager. So what does this transaction manager actually do? Well, the whole point is managing the locks. If a transaction needs to access a cell, it needs the lock. And it asks the transaction manager, please give me the lock. And then the transaction manager replies, and there's many possible replies. It can say, yes, you have the lock, it can give the lock, or it can wait. It can delay and wait, because maybe someone else is using the lock and it will let this one wait. Or it can say, no, you do not get the lock. You will not get the lock, okay? So there's different kinds of replies. And the transaction manager is designed so that the system will be serializable, but also make progress, okay? And when a transaction no longer needs the lock, so let's assume the transaction manager gives me the lock, so I'm a transaction. If I don't need the lock anymore, I have to give, I have to send a message, huh? I tell the transaction manager I don't need it anymore, okay? So this is the basic structure. So now the trick is, what does this transaction manager look like inside, okay? So there's a lot of stuff going on in this little box, okay? So now we get back to our axes of variation, because all of these different axes will affect the transaction manager, how we design it. So there's many, there, there's thousands of possible transaction managers. Very thick books have been written on theory of transaction managers. Huh? Well, there's a lot of theory behind it, there's a lot of possibilities. So I'm going to show you one 
transaction manager completely, and I will justify this one. But there are many others, and real systems can do different variations on this. But it's good to understand one, okay? So the first axis is optimism versus pessimism. Then the second one is lock management, that's for serializability. And the third one is how do you handle deadlocks? So this is a kind of circular dependency that I will talk about, okay? And so we need to satisfy both safety and liveness. So the lock management is used for safety, and the deadlock management is used for liveness, and it will use timestamps. So these two are very different. They're kind of orthogonal, okay? One of them is needed for safety, but it's not enough. If you only do that, but you don't do this, then you will not have liveness, okay? And your system may just block forever. So you have to do both to satisfy these both. And they're kind of independent of each other, okay? So you see, separating to safety and liveness is very important because there's very different techniques, okay? But first, let me talk about a, bit, a nice one, the first one, which is optimism versus pessimism. This is just a, this, is, this one is just a, an approach. Okay, there's different styles in this sense. Okay, so let's say a transaction starts, it asks for logs, and the transaction send a message to the transaction manager say, I want this log. Do I get it? Well, it actually depends on the situation. This is the notion of locks, locking up a thing is not just important for uh, data and databases. It actually is something that happens very often in the real world when I have activities that need resources. Okay? For example, airline booking. Okay? An airplane traveling is with, with the, this, the determining all the passengers is a transaction. Okay? A passenger booking a seat. It's a transaction. Now, this transaction will be optimistic. So what does that mean? Well, airlines, the point is that in order for the airline not to go broke, it has to have a lot of paying passengers because flying an airplane is expensive. So typically airlines will sell more tickets, 10 or 20% more. If I have 100 seats, they will sell 120 seats. And the reason is that they will assume that some of those people will cancel and that at the end of the day, the airplane will be basically full. So they increase the number of average seats. But, so that means when I ask for a seat, when I want to buy a ticket on an airline going from Brussels to uh, Stockholm, for example, uh, something which I've done many times, then the air, you just but says, yes, you have it, it's yours, fine. And then you walk up to the gate, and you're, you have your boarding pass and everything, and they say, oh, sorry, plane full. What, what happens here? Well, it's because the airlines, they always overbook. So that means the transaction manager will always give the locks. So the plane has 100 seats, so there's 100 locks. But, but the transaction manager does, just gives more, okay? It sells more tickets. And so sometimes it aborts, which means you cannot fly. Because, but aborting is not expensive. All that means is that you get rebooked on another flight. They don't punish you, they don't whip you, you don't die, okay? So it's not very serious, okay? Uh, it's not very serious. So optimistic scheduling means you, you are tending to give more locks, even if it might cause problems later. Because the problems are easy to solve. And it's important for certain reasons. So, because of the average number. Now, the other example of pessimism is railroad tracks. It's a classic example. I have a railway track between two cities, and it's very far away, 1,000 kilometers. So, there's only one track, for example, in some segment. So, if I have trains going in opposite directions, only one can get it, okay? So, if I want to reserve the segment, so a track segment, reserving a track segment is a lock, okay? So getting the reservation is a transaction, and being uh, uh, the transaction needs to lock that segment. But uh, what if two trains 
are observing in opposite directions. Ooh, the transaction manager is extremely prudent, pessimistic, okay? And this is actually, this can be, this is dynamic, huh? It's not something you do days in advance. You have signaling mechanisms. So when you actually are entering one of these track segments, you can have a red light, means you do not enter. So it, the transaction manager will tend not to give you a lot. It's like a bureaucrat, huh? If you ask a bureaucrat something, they will usually say no, okay? So this guy is like that. You will only be allowed to go on the segment if it's absolutely sure there's no other train in the opposite direction. And the reason is that a conflict, a problem is very expensive to solve. So if two trains crash, usually people die. So you don't want that. So you see this is a very different situation than airline booking, yeah? So here, in the case of railway track allocation, the transaction manager will be extremely pessimistic, and in the worst case, the trains will be slowing down because of this, okay? But that's okay. Slowing down is better than dying. So, uh, so sometimes when you're in a train, you probably notice this, the train just stops in the middle of nowhere. Why? Because there's a red light. Why is there a red light? Because there's a small chance that there's a conflict later somewhere. So it just stops. So the train companies are very, very conservative. Okay? So you see, this is the definition, optimistic versus pessimistic. Okay? I will show you today an optimistic algorithm because fixing uh, problems with bank money going between bank accounts, that's very easy, it's just reading and writing things in memory, okay? So it's not like an ATM where it's giving you actual bills, okay? If you do that, then it tends to be pessimistic because it's not going to give you more money than you have, okay? So, so the, the ATM, the money machines, typically have a very pessimistic. But I'm, I'm just talking about now transfers between accounts, so it's just reading and writing inside memory. So that'll be an optimistic outcome. Okay. So that's optimism versus pessimism. So that's the first axis. So this is kind of a choice. Now we go to lock management. This is the safety property. Making sure the transaction is serializable. Okay. So let's say we have two transactions. I give you just a simple example that's not going to work. So you see, we need to do something else. So we have T1 transferring money between two of my accounts. Let's say I have two accounts, C1 and C2, and it transfers money between them, uh, my savings and my checking account. So what does it do? It locks L1 for the savings account. It takes the money. It releases the lock. It gets the lock on the other one. It puts the money in. Okay, fine. But in between that, there's another transaction which calculates the total money in my accounts. So it locks L1, and then it later on, so this diagram is very important. So time is going from left to right, and each time I get a lock, it's like one step up. Huh? So I get L1 lock, I get L2 lock, I calculate the total money, then I release the two locks. But T2 will give a wrong value, my, I have missing money. What's going on here? So there's a problem. Huh? This, this lock management is not good. Huh? It's bad. So we have to do it differently. Okay? But let's make a break now, and I'll show you how to do it right after the break. Okay. So now we're doing lock management, which is a safety thing. We want the transactions to be serializable which means that it's as if one goes before the other. So in this scenario, it's not serializable. Because T1 is not before T2, T2 is not before T1. They're kind of overlapping in a funny way. And, and the result is clearly incorrect. So I will, I'm breaking an invariance of the system. The solution to this is to manage how the locks are given. The transaction manager doesn't just give locks in a, in a naive way, it's a little bit smarter than that. And so we have to make it serializable. That means when the transactions ask for locks, they have to get them in a way such that it's as if 
the two transactions are running in some order. And that gives them a, a, a interleaving semantics. Huh? So T2 will see the end state of T1, uh, or of the inversive. And the technique that's usually used for this is called two-phase locking, which means that basically a transaction will not do like in the previous one, where it gets a lock and then releases and then gets another lock, because that gives it leaves this gap. The transaction will only get locks to do its work, and when the work is done, it will release locks. Okay, so it's basically getting locks to do its work, and then when the work is done, it's releasing them. That means the transaction has two phases, and this is called the growing phase and the shrinking phase. So in the growing phase, it's only asking for locks here, L1, L2, and when it does work, and if it needs more locks, then it would keep going up, huh? but it can start doing work already when it has enough locks, and when it's done, it will release, when it doesn't need a lock anymore, it will release it, so it will release them. If you do that, it look, they look like these little ladders going up and down. Uh, and T2, you see the T1 now, it keeps T1, uh, L1, while it's getting L2. So at the end, when it releases L1, T2 can get L1, okay? If you do that, then you can prove that the transactions are serializable, okay? So that is the basic technique. It's called two-phase locking, okay? Not to be confused with two-phase commit, which is something for distributed transaction, totally different. Here it's for making the transactions serializable and how you manage the locks. Two-phase locking, growing and shrinking phase. Basically, all transaction managers that are practical ones will use some variation of two-phase locking. It's by far the most used uh, technique for making transactions serializable. So you see, it's not that hard, actually, yeah? to make them serializable. Of course, there might be some extra overhead. Maybe if you do that, maybe you keep the lock too long. Maybe I can, I don't actually, once I read L1, I don't need the value anymore, but I keep it anyway until I'm completely done. So, so I'm kind of uh, being a little bit conservative in order to be safe. Huh? To not break the invariant. Okay, so two-phase locking is the basic idea. There's then one extra thing that is done, uh, which is a, a kind of optimization. So two-phase locking is enough. Huh? With two-phase locking, you will get serializable transaction. But real systems usually will not do exactly two-phase locking. They will do a, a little variation of it. And it's because of this issue. So there's an issue that occurs but it's not wrong, huh? it's just an efficiency and complexity issue. So let's say we have three transactions. So I'll give you an example. T1 gets these three locks, it releases locks, but somehow L1, the final one, it keeps it for a long time before releasing it. Okay, okay sorry, it keeps this lock, but it releases L1. So there's another lock that it keeps for a long time here. Huh? But once it releases L1, T2 can get L1 right away. That's okay. There's an L0 which is kept, but T2 doesn't need that. So T2 does its work, okay? And when T2 releases L2, some other lock, then T3 can start getting L2. So you see, they're kind of overlapping because of the, the growing and shrinking phases. Uh, it depends on the particular lock. As soon as T1 doesn't need L1 anymore, T2 can get it. That's fine, huh? it's completely correct. It's completely correct, but it gives a kind of strange behavior. So let's say T1 keeps going and it doesn't commit, it aborts. Well, the system then has to force T2 and T3 to abort as well. Okay? Because T2 uses L1 
So it uses cell 1, which has been modified by T1. But if T1 aborts, the L1, the cell value, will be restored to its original one, which means that T2 was using a wrong value. That means T2 has to abort as well. And for the same reason, T3 has to abort. And maybe there's more transactions connected. It's a chain, okay? It's, called, it's a kind of what's called a cascade. So this is called cascading abort. Okay, so this is not incorrect, huh? I repeat, this is completely correct. It's just a behavior that causes the system to be quite complicated. That means T2, when it commits, it's not truly committing yet. If there's a dependency, T2 depends on T1. So the commit of T2 depends on the commit of T1. So this creates dependencies between the transactions that the system has to keep track of, okay? Uh, T1 aborts, T2 and T3 must abort as well. So T2 and T3 have to dynamically keep track of the transactions they depend on. And it's a chain, it's recursive, but it can get pretty long. This is, you can implement this, some systems do this, but it's complicated. So usually, systems don't want to do this, so they actually make a variation on two-phase locking, so this doesn't happen. Okay. You can actually do a, a, a kind of stronger version of two-phase locking, so this cascading abort doesn't happen. Okay. So, okay. so remember, this is not an error. Huh? Cascading abort is perfectly okay. It's just something that's undesirable and causes complexity at the implementation. So usually what happens is we make uh, we change a little bit the two-phase locking so the cascading abort doesn't happen. And the change is called strict two-phase locking. So what that means is that there's still a growing phase, but there's no longer a shrinking phase. All the locks are released at the same time. That means there's no dependencies. The dependencies are not possible. Huh? If I release a lock, then this one will use the lock, and there's another one that goes cannot happen anymore. Okay? If I release all the locks at once. Of course, I will, I will actually reduce a little bit the performance of this, because that means that some locks have to be kept longer than necessary. Okay? Maybe L1 or L3 here, maybe I can already release it here because I don't need it anymore, but I will keep it to the end. All the locks are kept until I don't need any more. Okay. And they're all released at once. So there's a trade-off here. You see, cascading abort theoretically has higher performance, but it's more complicated. So maybe it's not that much higher performance because of the complexity. Whereas this one is much easier to implement, but it has maybe a little bit lower performance because you will keep the locks too long. That means T2 has to wait until T1 is completely done. So that slows down a little bit the system. Okay? But the trade-off is that most transaction systems will do this. So if you look at transaction systems, real industrial transaction systems, most of them, almost all of them, will be doing strict two-phase locking. Okay? Because it enormously simplifies because there's no dependencies between the transactions if you do that. Once a transaction is done, it's over. The others are independent of it. And that's an enormous simplification. Okay? So that's what the transaction manager will be doing when I ask for a lock. When I release the lock, the transaction manager will release them all at the same time. So when the transaction doesn't need a lock anymore, the transaction manager will not give that lock to somebody else until the first transaction has released all of its locks, and then it will give them all, okay? See, that's strict to this lock. So that guarantees safety, you know, serializability. Now there's now the elephant in the room, which I have not talked about, which is the third one, which is deadlock. This is much harder, okay? But in order to introduce deadlock, let's build the transaction system. So we're going to start building one. I start with a very simple one. Let's design a simple transaction system. 
It does optimistic concurrency control, and it does strict two-phase locking. Okay, so here's the algorithm for the transaction manager. It's quite simple. When a transaction requests the lock, and the cell is unlocked, nobody has it, it gets the lock. Okay? If the cell is already locked, then the transaction waits. That means the transaction manager will not send a reply. It will cause the transaction to wait. And it will keep waiting until it's unlocked. And when a transaction that has the lock commits or aborts, all the locks are released at once, and then the waiting transactions will get those locks. Okay? So this is a strict two-phase locking. Huh? You see how it works, huh? You get locks, but if someone else is using it, you wait. So this is doing strict two-phase locking, and it's optimistic. That means if the cell is unlocked, just give it, okay? Okay? Getting the lock like that, with no other conditions, will not lead to problems, okay? So this is already the transaction manager. Uh, and it's correct, it's safe, but it will not satisfy lightness, okay? This one has a problem, but it's never going to make an error, huh? but it might stop running. It suffers from deadlock. This one is perfectly safe, but not alive. Okay. And so here's an example. So this now you, you see this, this is what we did, huh? We built the correct one. Safety is satisfied, but not liveness. So let's say, so here's a, 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 an example scenario. Let's say T1 and T2. And both of them use cells C1 and C2. Okay? And T1 first needs C1 and then needs C2 later on. C2 will first use C2 and then needs C1 later on. So these are two concurrent transactions, so the scheduler will be scheduling them. So T1 gets C1's lock, sure. T2 gets C2's lock. So that can happen. Huh? The scheduler can, can uh, choose the execution of the threads like that. And T1 then needs C2 and it will wait until T2 releases C2. But T2 needs C1, and it will wait until T1 releases C1. And they're each waiting on the other. You see what's happening? They wait forever. So this is not, this is still safe though. Nothing wrong is done. It's just that nothing is done, okay? So how do we fix that? But the fix for this is not so simple. It's harder than just one magic wand. We need to think a little bit. There is some fundamental thing going on here. Okay? So let's understand what's going on, and then we can fix it. Uh, so you see this naive algorithm. It's nice, but still, something wrong. And the thing that's wrong is called deadlock. And deadlock is a very general uh, condition, and it can happen in many, many, many places, not just in transaction managers. It can happen in any system where I have active entities on one side, transactions or humans or cars on the road or airplanes, any kind of an active entity, and resources. And that the active entity needs resources to do something, and when it's done, it releases resources. So if I have such a system, and if I don't do anything special, such a system can always go into deadlock. So there's a, a classic example is the route in the, the a, 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 a intersection. Um, so here's a road. So let me just give this simple example. So here is an intersection. Okay. So now that there's these four parts, and there's cars, okay, okay, going, and you have lights, okay, or whatever. Now, so normally this thing will work fine with the lights, but let's say people get a little bit crowded, so there's resources and active entities. 
So the resource, the, the active entities are the cars. The resources are these squares on the intersection. So this resource A, A for example, will be used by this car or by this car. These two cars will both need the resources. So assume that somehow the car has gotten here and then stops. This car has gotten here, this car has gotten here, and this one has gotten here. So each car gets one resource, but it needs a second one. And, and there's a cyclic dependency here. And there's four cars. So this actually happens in big cities. And it's a major problem because the car cannot back up, usually because there's a bunch of cars already behind. So it's, once this happens, things slow down a lot because the cars have to somehow get off of it. That's an example of a deadlock, okay? And it happens in many, many systems. And here it happens in transactions. So you have a transaction, the transactions T1 and T2, and you have the resources, which are the cells, okay? And a transaction will need resources to do its work. So you, you define to, to, to determine this, you need to define what are the overall dependencies between the entities and the resources. So you define a concept called the wait for graph. So this is a graph with two kinds of nodes, the transactions and the cells. And we have, a, uh, so it's a directed graph. We have an arrow between a transaction and a cell if the transaction is waiting for the cell. And we have an arrow between a cell and a transaction if the cell is locked by that transaction. So here, for example, C1 is locked by T1, and C2 is locked by T2. But T1 is waiting for C2, and T2 is waiting for C1. This causes a cycle, okay? So a cycle in the wait for graph means that the execution stops, okay? So the problem is cycles in the wait for graph. So somehow, this is bad that you make, this should not happen. So how can we arrange that in our transaction manager? So this is a very nasty problem, okay? <coughs> so you see the formal definition now. So we define this graph, and while the system is running, at any instant of the running system, there exists a wait for a graph. And it's changing as transactions get locks and release locks. Huh? And any time a cycle occurs in this graph, that part of the system will stop, okay? That is the thing. So here's a cycle with two transactions. You can have any number in this kind of cycle. In the example of the cars, it's a cycle with four active entities, huh? But you can have them with any number, okay? So you see, this is it. You have to be very precise, huh? This is a formally defined thing, huh? the wait for a graph. And so you, we are now looking at graph algorithms. We have basically to do cycle detection in this graph, okay? And this graph is a dynamic graph. It can be, it's always changing when the system is running. Okay. So you see, this is kind of a fundamental problem. Huh? It's, not, it's not something you can avoid easily. It's fundamental because it always happens in such a system where you have active entities and resources. Deadlock is, is fundamental. So we have to do something uh, to solve this. So how do we solve it? Okay, well let's discuss a little bit. So deadlocks can happen in many places in the real world. So cars in the new section is one example, or trains in a track, or people walking on the street, uh, or people trying to go through a door, the door is the resource. Uh, and it can happen in so many places. So once you're sensitive to that, you see that there's so many places. Usually humans have some kind of a, uh, their brain is wired to see that there's a potential deadlock and they will do something to avoid it. But it's not always possible, like in the car, it really happens. Okay, now this is actually a real problem. You can say, okay, fine, but is it a real problem? Let's say we have a bank, a big bank, and it's running Lots of transactions simultaneously, hundreds per second are being run, or even thousands in a really big bank. It's a huge transaction processing system. 
you have maybe 10 million customers at certain times of the day. So for example, when I, when I go into a, a store and I buy something and I type uh, my PIN code, that's a transaction, huh? That will transfer money to be transferred from my account to some other account. So there's an actual transaction going on. And you can see that many people can be buying simultaneously all over the world, okay? And that all goes to the different banks. So there can be a huge number per second. So this system seems very busy, lots of stuff going on. Let's say we have four transactions in a deadlock. These four have stopped. They're just sitting there, doing nothing. But all the others are still running. So it's not hard, it's not easy to tell. You have this big system, and part of the system is dead, okay? But the rest is running, so it, the activity of the system still seems very high. So how do you detect, how do you manage this thing? Part of the system is not working, okay? So there's two ways to solve this. It's like, you can consider deadlock kind of like a disease, okay? And the two solutions are prevention or cure. Prevention means, whenever I try to make a lock, and this would create a cycle, I avoid it. I, I, I say no, I forbid it. So you never actually create a cycle. And deadlock detection means that periodically, you run a cycle detection algorithm on your wait for graph because these cycles will stay forever, huh? so you don't have to worry about when you run this algorithm. Anytime is fine. And periodically you run this algorithm. And when it sees a deadlock, you have to break the cycle. So the usual way to break it is to force one of the transactions to abort. Okay. It's kind of nasty, but yeah, so that's one way. So there's these two ways. So we're going to do something now, and I'm going to show you a deadlock avoidance algorithm, okay? Deadlock avoidance, and we're going to use priorities for this. So we have to add some asymmetry, yeah? We have this symmetrical situation, which cannot happen. Okay, so let's modify our naive algorithm so that it will never create a cycle. And how do we do that? Well, we give the transactions priorities. We say earlier transactions have higher priority than later ones, so there's not symmetric. Okay? So when, when transactions are trying to get a lock, then we look at the priority. So when a transaction tries to get a lock, and let's say the lock is already taken. Ooh, that's a dangerous situation. It can lead to deadlock, okay, if you wait. Well, we compare priorities. If the lower priority transaction has the lock, and there's a higher priority one that needs the lock, then we actually uh, abort the lower priority one and restart it. So we basically say, you will abort, and all the work you did up to now is canceled, but you can restart, okay? And, but when you restart with no locks, and you try to get locks, and the lock is given to the higher priority one. So the higher priority one will not be stopped, okay? If it sees any low priority in its path, it, those are basically wiped away, okay? Now, if the higher priority one, so if there's a low priority one, wants the lock, and it's taken by a high priority one, the low priority just waits. So you see it's not symmetrical, huh? So with this algorithm, you can prove that no deadlocks will occur. Because the very highest priority, the very first transaction, will never be blocked. Okay? It will always continue and it will eventually terminate. And when it terminates, the next one has highest priority and the same holds. So the system will always progress and no cycles will ever cause it to stop. Okay? So you see, adding priorities will fix this. And this is a deadlock avoidance because you, you don't create the cycles. If there's a chance that you have a cycle, you restart the other one. Now, of course, this has a price. This will slow down the system, okay? 
because maybe that low priority transaction has already done a lot of work. It's all canceled. Oof. Has to restart. That's it. That's the price to pay in this algorithm for deadlock avoidance is that it causes a little bit slowdown. But a little bit slowdown is much better than stopping. Uh -huh. Okay, so here is the algorithm. So this is kind of a pseudo code huh? Uh -huh. of the algorithm. But so if you want to see the actual code, you can see. But uh, so here, when you create a new transaction, you give it lower priority than all active transactions. So priority is monotonically decreasing forever. So there's some integer that that manages the, what is the priority level. Huh? And when a transaction tries to get a lock, if the cell is unlocked. You just give it. Again, it's just optimistic. But if the cell is already locked, but it's locked by a high priority, mm, the low priority one is going to wait, okay? When I'm driving on the road and uh, the prime minister comes, I stop and I let him pass, okay? And then I wait. But if the cell is locked by a lower priority transaction, aha, I will restart that transaction which basically means I will forcibly abort, abort it. So you see, there has to be more than just locks going between the transaction manager and the transactions. The transaction manager can cause, force a transaction to abort and restart, okay? So it forcibly aborts and restarts with the same priority, okay? So the high priority transaction gets the lock and continues, okay? And when a transaction, any transaction, commits, it releases all its locks, and then there are waiting transactions on the locks. Huh? One waiting transaction is dequeued per lock. When a transaction aborts, it will restore the states and release the locks. Okay? And then dequeued when waiting transaction per lock. You see, so basically the priorities will solve the problem of deadlock. So here's a state diagram that uh, shows the state of a transaction in this algorithm. So the transaction starts here. It is in a start state. And it starts running. So it's here. It's running. The code is running. And it asks for a lock. OK. If the lock is not taken, it gets the lock. So I get, keep running with the lock. And in the nice case, eventually I'm done, and I either commit or abort, okay? But I could ask for a lock that's already taken, okay? So I wait, okay? So normally I wait, okay? Now, uh, if it's a low priority, then I get the lock. But if a high priority transaction needs one of my locks, any of my locks, not even the one I'm waiting for, then I restart. Okay, here also, uh, I can either be in the waiting or the running state. In the running state, if a high priority transaction needs one of my locks, so I'm running, da -da -da, I'm minding my own business, I'm doing very nice things, and all of a sudden, some high priority transaction needs one of my locks. I'm dead, okay, it kills me, I get restarted, yeah? But doesn't that mean that if you just create uh, a flood of high priority transactions, the low priorities will never get done? Ah, but uh, whenever you create a transaction, it has lower priority than all the others. Okay, so that's So, yeah, so, so that when you create a transaction, if you create a flood of transactions, they will all have successively lower priorities. So. Huh? The first one that you create will be the highest. Huh? So the first one, life is beautiful, nobody can stop it. Huh? Is that answering the it question? Is, uh, you can't just arbitrarily give priorities. The system gives priorities. Okay. That makes sense. And, and then you can show by induction. There's always one transaction which has the highest priority, and nobody can stop it. Huh? So here, for example, let's say the lock is already taken here. I wait, okay? Usually I will wait until the transaction releases the lock, and then I'm back here. But while I'm waiting, 
oh, this nasty high priority guy needs one of my logs, and that's all it's over. Huh? So the restart basically means you you reset your state and you start again at the start state. So it's so it's like you're cascading these diagrams. Huh? The restart will be a start in the next incarnation. Huh? So you start again this diagram basically. Huh? When you do a restart, huh? it's the start state of the next incarnation. So the real diagram is you're connecting these, huh? if you want, huh? and the number of links is kind of arbitrary. It depends on how many higher priority transactions there are. So this is the basic algorithm. You see, you see how it works? So you understand how it works? So this algorithm is nice, it's correct. It still has a small problem, so the implementation I show you will not be exactly this one. The problem with this algorithm, there's, well I mean the, the problem, it, 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 there's a complexity issue here. So this is a correct algorithm, right? It's correct. But there is an issue, and it's kind of nasty of the implementation, because it terminates a running transaction at an arbitrary point during its execution. So I'm running, and I have three logs. Some high priority transaction comes along anytime, it needs one of those three logs. And it just kills me right there. Okay. While I'm running at some arbitrary point. So I'm updating data structures and stuff. So being terminated at an arbitrary point is actually not so nice. You have to be careful. Okay. It's better if you could terminate the transaction at a well defined point. For example, at the point when the transaction asks for a lock, you can be kind of nice. Okay. So the high priority transaction can be nice and not brutal. It can say, oh, this low priority has a lock that I need. Let it, let it run. If it terminates, I let it terminate. So I wait a little, but I'm sure it will terminate eventually. But if it asks for another lock, then I will restart it. Okay, so we want to we change the algorithm a little bit so that the transactions are not arbitrarily killed, but they're only restarted at well-defined points. That means when the high priority transaction comes in, it doesn't immediately kill the low priority one, it marks it, it gives it a little check mark. And if that low priority tries to get a lock, at that point the high priority one will step in and say, yeah, actually, I was here, I'm here, we will restart you. At that point, it will restart. So that's a somewhat improved algorithm. So let's say, so it adds one new state, which I call probation. So this, it's running, okay? So the, the low priority one is running. And all of a sudden, the high priority one needs my, my box. Well, it puts me in probation state. So I'm still running now. So I'm still, I keep running, no problem. And if, if, I'm, if I eventually terminate, then fine, it lets me terminate. So it's actually much nicer. A transaction that has gotten all of its locks and just running, I will actually let it terminate. Because the high priority one will, will be a little bit slowed down, but still it's guaranteed to get the lock, okay? But if the, the low priority one asks for a new lock, woo, during the probation, then it's all over, okay? So we're being nice, but only up to a point to this guy, huh? So if he asks for another lock, then we restart. Because that can lead to deadlock, okay? But this arrow here, there's no extra locks. So basically, the, it's just running, doing some, some computation, and eventually will complete. So there's nothing that can stop here. Huh? So we're assuming the transactions all terminate. Huh? The assumption is they will all terminate. So a transaction in probation state is not allowed to get locks. If it tries to get a lock, it restarts. It's like, I call probation because it's like a, a prisoner in a, in a prison on good behavior. They can let him out before the final day if he's nice. And so he's on probation. But if he does any, anything here, which is like a crime, so asking for a lock is like a crime, he goes back into prison, okay? 
So we can kind of free the guy in advance, but the condition is that he can't do anything nasty. Okay? So that's why I call it a probation state. So with this, the termination is always at a well-defined point. It's at the point where the transaction asks for a lock or is waiting. Yeah? So at a well-defined point in the code, when the transaction is actually stopped, uh, and then you restart it at that point. So all the data structure is in a reasonable state. Okay? So that's how it works. Okay, I can actually run this guy for you. I have the code here. Okay. Mm. Let me... What is this? I don't want to skip, want to skip this up there. Okay. Let me see if I can get it to start. So here is... Here is the logic system. <coughs> Here is the, the transaction manager. So this is the actual implementation of it. Huh? Transaction manager. So it's using active objects. It's using a primary <coughs> queue. And here is the actual transaction manager. See, it's a nice bit of code here. Huh? Ooh, huh? So let me get it all and compile it. So I've, I've compiled it now. Now, let me just show you an example of, of it. So there's no syntactic support, huh? so you'll see it's, it's using higher order. Huh? You'll see how it works. So here's some example code. So let me show you how it works. Okay, so here's how it works. So I have a procedure called new trans. And when I call it, I create a new transaction manager. And because transaction use cells, it doesn't use the cells of the system as its own cells. So I do a new cell primitive. Okay. So here, for example, I make a database. I have a tuple with 1,000 elements. And each element, d.i, will be a, a cell. So this is my example from the beginning. I have a thousand cells. And now, how do transactions actually work? Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Here. OK. If I want to run a transaction, I have to run this procedure trans. And trans will take any statement and run it as a transaction, which is a procedure, okay? It also returns things like abort and commit and abort, which I won't show here. So here I, I have 1,000 array element. I take three random numbers. So let's say I have here a random number generator generating numbers from 1 to 1,000. I get three random numbers, i, j, k. Now, the cells have three operations. Access, assign, and exchange. Okay, the read, write, and so it's not doing the syntax, but it's the same. So these operations are usable inside because this procedure has an argument, T. And T is a record that contains all the operations I can do. So T.access will actually access the cell, D.I. So this is a cell that's been created by new cell T. Yeah? access d.j, access d.k. So I read three cells, three random cells, and then I will assign them. d.i, I will assign it to a plus b minus c. d.j will be a minus b plus c. And d.k will be minus a plus b plus c. If you, if you sum these three, you'll see that the total sum of all the elements is going to be the same. Huh? A plus A minus A, that's A. B minus B plus B is B. 
minus c plus c plus c. So these three assignments are just going to shuffle numbers around. It's just an example. And then to make it even weirder, I'm going to add another statement. If i is equal to j, or i is equal to k, or j is equal to k, then I can force an abort. Okay? So these three should be different numbers. If each, any of the two are the same, I will just abort. So this is a transaction. So this procedure mix will basically take three random entries of this database and mix them around. Okay. 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 And notice the initial value of each element is i. Eh? So the the one Cell number one has value one, cell number two has value two, so there's already a thousand integers in there. Okay, and I mix them around, and now I have like another transaction here. I want to sum all of them. So this is a pretty big transaction, okay? I will, uh, I create a new cell, S, I sign zero, I do 1,000 this operation. So S is going to access some, this transaction is going to access all the values, but atomically, yeah? And it will return the sum of all the values. Okay? So if I run this, it will display the sum of the integers from 1 to 1,000. And then I will mix them. Here I will create, I do 1,000 of these mix transactions, but in their own threads. Ooh, so I'm very nasty, eh? They will all be done concurrently. So let me run this. Run that one, and this one, and this one. Okay. So all of these are good. Okay, they're all being compiled. I also define the sum function and its its cell. Oh, I missed I missed the character like this. There we go. Now let me run these guys. First, let me browse sum. Just do the sum transaction. Here it's. 500,500, that's good, huh? Now I will run this guy. I will mix up the elements. A thousand. So I'm doing a thousand concurrent transactions. Oh, it's going to mix everything up very nicely. Okay, and I run some again. And it's still the same. The invariant is maintained. But did it actually do something? Well, here's a, another transaction. I'm going to Display the first 10 elements, so you can verify that it's actually mixed. Huh? So from 1 to 10, I will display the, at the content of d.i. So you can see that it's kind of mixed up together. Huh? If I run this again, it will be mixed again, and there will be different values. So these are different values. Some of them are very high. Some of them are very low. So you see the values kind of start getting extreme. Huh? The original one was from 1 to 1,000. Here I have 143,000 minus 88,000. And the sum is, should still be 500,500. Oof. So it seems to be bug free. Huh? So that's the transaction manager running. So it's running this exact algorithm, what I'm showing you here. It's running this exact algorithm. And let me just very quickly go, I'm not going to give you the whole code. So basically, I have new trans, and it has the creation of a cell, and I can execute a transaction here, and I have four operations. as access, assign, exchange, and abort. And I gave you an example. Okay, so how is this implemented? So it's using active objects. It's a multi-agent system. It's nice, huh? In order to implement shared state thing, I'm using multi-agent system. And there's these several messages are possible. 
get log. So the transaction sends messages. It asks for the log. And here I can synchronize. I wait until sync is bound, but it could be halt, which means I have to stop. Okay. I can also save state of the, of, uh, the, cell, the cell. I can commit and I can abort. Okay. So it's, <laughs> so it's a little bit more than just locks. Okay. So I get a lock. I either get okay or halt. I can save states. Okay. And I commit or abort. Okay. And the transaction manager keeps track of everything. Inside the transaction manager, each transaction has a record, which the timestamp, remember we had the timestamp, a dictionary, which contains all the saved states, because you need to, when you abort, the body, the code that we're running, okay, and the state. This is from our state diagram, running, waiting on, or probation, and also the result, okay. Each cell also has information. It has a name, a unique constant. It has an owner, which is the transaction that currently locks it. It has a queue, which is a priority queue of transactions waiting on that cell. And then it has a current state, which is a real cell, a real system cell. This is cell is the cell in the abstraction. And finally, there is a priority queue. So a priority queue is a queue but the entries are always ordered. So each entry has a priority, and if you, when you put in a new entry, if it's high priority, it's put in the front. Okay? They're always ordered according to priority. So that's important because the transactions have priorities. Huh? So I insert x with an integer priority p. I dq. When I dq, I will return the entry with the smallest uh, value, which is going to be the highest priority transaction. Huh? Uh, I remove an entry with priority P, which must exist, okay? So each lock cell has a priority queue waiting transactions. And it guarantees that when the lock is released, that the highest priority will get it, okay? That's why you need priori priority queue. Okay, so that's it. So you see the real thing, no magic. All the code is there. You see completely how it works, okay? Uh, no hand waving, no magic, it's all there. So conclusion, transaction is big atomic actions, very useful for fault tolerance, big fault tolerance systems, large databases. So this is a major thing. Huh? This kind of asset transaction is supporting very strongly the information economy. Huh? So without transactions, it would be much, much harder. Transaction systems have strong implementation constraints, safety, liveness, okay, safety, for serializability, uh, liveness, deadlock, also other properties, uh, resilience, performance, scalability, and we saw some concurrency control. So we saw optimistic concurrency control with strict two-phase locking and deadlock avoidance. So this phrase, we saw it, okay? It's the most complicated algorithm in the book. Uh, and you can, if you want, you can see the code. It's doing exactly the state diagram I showed. Okay, so now we're at the end. Maybe I say a few words on the exam. I don't know if you have any questions. So the final exam will be very similar to the midterm. There will be uh, theory and practical questions. I can ask you to write code, uh, not thousands of lines, but small, the things I can ask you to write them that can be variations on what we saw in the course, maybe active object, maybe monitor, okay? I can ask you semantics, what's semantics of monitor? Okay, what's semantics of lazy execution? Uh, all of the stuff corresponding to the midterm will be in one question. If you leave that question blank, you will get the points of the midterm. It'll be on five points. Huh? If you don't leave it blank, anyway, I will give you the maximum. So if you're happy with your midterm results, you, they're yours, you keep them, okay? But if you want to do better, you can answer the first question, okay? Okay, so that's...
it. I hope you liked the course and all the concepts we saw. Some of them are not yet used in industry, but they may hopefully will be in some years. Like uh, deterministic data flow with ports, probably it will eventually be used, but, but I'm not that optimistic. It'll probably take 20 years or so. Uh -huh. But and other things I hope will be more and more deprecated, like monitors. I hope they go away, but unfortunately they probably will not go away. And the proof is that people are still even using COBOL programs today, okay? which is a thing that should have died long ago, but no, it's still alive. There's even object-oriented versions of COBOL. Oof, boggles the mind. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much, and good luck for the, for the final exam.